OK, hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on how language shapes thought categorization in the South Pacific. My name is Mike Frangier and I, along with my colleagues Greg Corbett and Ali Grandison from the University of Surrey, will be giving the talk today as part of the ESRC Festival of Social Science. Um, at the end of our talk, we're going to have a we'll have time to answer a few questions from the audience. So throughout the talk, please write your questions in the Q&A tab on your right hand side under uh, the my questions area. We're not going to be publishing the questions, so don't worry if you can't see anyone else's questions. Um, that's just normal and we'll pick and choose a few of uh, the more pertinent ones at the end to answer those. Uh, if you look at the feature tab in the Q&A section, there, that's where you can find our email address. So if you'd like the images that have been created for our project by a graphic uh, designer, please send us your postal address and we can send you out a postcard featuring one of them later. As part of our talk today, we've got a bit of an interactive element. So please keep a tab open on the Poll Everywhere website. You can find the uh, web address there on the right hand side again as well in the featured tab. Um, and this part of the talk will become live when we get to that uh, part of the talk. Uh, we've also put a link into an anonymous feedback form which takes less than a minute to fill in and you have a chance to win a £50 Amazon voucher. OK, so our current research project looks into whether or not the languages we speak affect the way we think. And we're doing this by looking at how people categorise the objects around them and if, lang and if the language they speak have an effect on the categories made. So I'm just going to start off with a few sort of uh, questions to get you thinking. So do the languages we speak affect the way we think? And some of you are going to be monolingual and some of you are going to be multilingual. So if you think about the languages you speak, do does speaking a different language help make you think differently? And look at the objects around you. How would you categorize those objects? How would you put objects together uh, that are similar? And in what ways would you do that? OK, here's an overview of what we're going to be looking at today. And we're just going to start off with a, a quick introduction to our team. Um, oh, actually, first things first, let's do our first online poll. So we'd like you to have a go at categorizing these objects. So if you either open a new browser tab or a window to the to the Poll Everywhere website, um, or you can open it on your mobile phone and you'll be able to type in your ideas about which objects you think could be grouped together. So it should be live now. Um, so if you go to www.pollev.com forward slash optimal, uh, you should see um, the 10 images here. Uh, so we've got a co some coconuts, uh, a dry coconut, a green coconut, and a germinating or sprouting coconut. Uh, we've got fire, a machete, uh, a pig which is alive, a pig which is roasting, a canoe, uh, basket, and a house. So I'd just like you to tell me how you think you'd group those objects together. In what ways do you think they're similar? Uh, sorry, it should be the link uh, it should be pollev.com not forward slash optimal O P T I M A L not uh, classifiers, which someone's just pointed out in the Q and A section. So we've got the wrong one. That's an old one we had running. So someone's put up already. So animals um, pigs together roasted or not. So all the pigs to go together. That's a good way of putting these two together. So if you haven't got on, it's pollev.com forward slash optimal, not forward slash classifiers. OK, so someone would group all the animals together and everything else would go into a non animals uh, category. Someone's going to put all the coconuts together. Uh, all the different containers, so a house, a boat, a bag and a basket. OK, so I guess a, a boat or canoe could be a container because you can sit inside of it. Things reared, made, grown by man, uh, living versus food items. All rustic, so all the traditionally made items, the manufactured items. Fire and house go together. All the round things, so the coconuts and animals and pigs together. Uh, the canoe and the house made together because they're both made from wood or plants. That's a good idea. And especially you could also put the basket in there as well because they're all traditionally made artifacts. OK, well, thanks very much for your answers. Obviously, there's many different ways that we can categorize the objects around us by shape, size, function or even color. Um, and uh, we're going to be looking at a bit how how different languages can categorize the objects as well a bit later. 
OK, so now if you'd like to come back, you can leave this tab open because we'll come back to another poll later. But if you come back to uh, our talk, we can continue now. OK, so. Um, We've got quite a large team working on this project, so myself along with Grev and Ali are the main project members, and we also have a couple of research assistants, Kat and Keris, who are helping produce this event today as well, and they're working hard in the background to make sure everything runs smoothly. We also have a large team of consultants and language experts uh, and some local uh, stakeholders who have been working in vernacular literacy and indigenous language education in Vanuatu and New Caledonia as well. Um, so our current project focuses on six languages spoken in the South Pacific countries of Vanuatu and New Caledonia. And today we're going to be focusing on two of them. So North Ambrim, which is spoken in Vanuatu, uh, and EI, which is spoken in New Caledonia. Now, both countries have a similar population, but they vary in the amount of the indigenous languages spoken and in the colonial legacy of introduced languages and in the languages of education. Vanuatu has well over 100 indigenous languages uh, and it became independent in 1980 from a joint Anglo-French rule, whereas New Caledonia has around 30 indigenous languages and it's still an overseas territory of France. Uh, in Vanuatu, the official languages are English and French, which are the main languages of education, along with the Creole language Bislama, which functions as a lingua franca among the different language communities. In New Caledonia, the official language is French, um, which also serves as the lingua franca of the country. So both countries are also promoting the use of indigenous languages in education to various degrees, although um, in the last few years this has been sort of uh, been uh, gaining traction as well. OK, I'm going to pass over to my colleague uh, Grev, who's going to be giving a little introduction to different types of linguistic categorization that we find in the languages. Thank you. <clears throat> so we've seen that uh, categorization involves treating some things as the same and some as different. So uh, given these toy bricks, if we want to build something, we might choose to categorize them as small, medium and large and work from uh, the contents of three buckets. But we might have another strategy. We might get started and then decide we need a set of yellow bricks. And as we go, put all of those into one bucket to work from. And languages can work differently too. Um, let's look at two very different systems. So if we look at Russian, we see the first example with journal, um, a magazine which requires the verb will to agree with it. There are a whole lot of nouns like this, including um, nouns like brat, brother, Um, and since um, Brat is um, a male, we treat this gender, we call this gender the masculine. In two, Gazeta is very different. That requires an agreeing verb, Willa. There are other nouns like Sistra in this group, and so we call these the feminine, and there are thousands of those. Then there's a piece more, a letter, which requires again a different verb form, Willa. Um, we call those the neuter, and again, thousands like that. And the main thing to retain about Russian is that by and large, nouns stay in their genders. They stay in their bucket. Uh, Gazeta is feminine, whatever else happens. Let's look at a contrasting system. We'll move on to Armese, one of the oceanic languages. You can see from the map that it's uh, spoken top right there. And here we've just given you one noun, ani, a coconut, uh, but it's classified in different ways. So we have the uh, possessive part, the k, in the examples that tells you it's mine, and then four different ways of classifying it according to our relation to the possession. So in one, if I plan to eat it, it'll be ak. If I plan to drink it, as in two, it'll be imak. Uh, for the planting it, a different form again, esak. Um, and then for anything else you might want to do, uh, like sitting on it. So we've seen two extremes, Russian on the one hand, where nouns 
typically are classified one way and stay that way. Uh, and parmes, where there are different ways for one and the same item according to the possessor's relation to it. And more generally in Oceanic, we find uh, these classifiers in possessive constructions. Languages vary considerably. There can be just two up to well over 30, each of them highlighting a different way of interacting with the possession. But the favoured ones are for uh, edible, drinkable and others. And we'll see yet more in uh, North Ambrin and EI when we come to those. So, how does all this relate to thought? I'll pass you on to Ali for her thoughts on that. Thank you, Grev. So one question that intrigues us is whether these different systems of linguistic categorization have an impact on the way we think about the world. And there's lots of evidence to suggest that they do. For example, German and Spanish speakers were presented with objects of differing gender and asked to list adjectives associated with them. Bridge in Spanish is masculine, but feminine in German, whereas key in Spanish is feminine, but masculine in German. And the adjectives given by the participants were then independently rated as being either feminine or masculine qualities. And nouns that were feminine in gender were more likely to have feminine qualities associated with them, and nouns that were masculine in gender were more likely to have masculine qualities. So intriguingly, participants' conceptualisation of objects seems to be affected by the gender system found in their language. And in another study, um, they looked at memory recall in Spanish and German, and objects that had different genders in Spanish and German were given personal names that either matched or didn't match the gender of the object. For example, apple, as you can see here, is feminine in Spanish and masculine in German. And some of the participants saw a personal name that matched the gender of the object and others saw one that mismatched. And participants found it easier to remember the personal name when it was congruent with the gender of the object. So here we have evidence for the effect of gender on memory recall, a specific type of thought. So there appears to be empirical support for the notion that language influences thought, but there is also lots of evidence for thought in the absence of language. And this is shown, for example, by pre-linguistic categorisation in infants. So infants as young as one month of age are able to form categorical representations of numerous types of stimuli that they don't have words for. And this happens for colours, for facial expressions, for animals and a range of different forms. So additionally, lots of the evidence for the influence of language on cognition involves slow and considered tasks where participants have time to access and make use of verbal labels. And we also see evidence of categorization in tasks that involve very quick responses, where our brains don't have time to access language. So language isn't influencing thought in every context. Now, gender systems are an excellent testing ground to explore the relationship between language and thought because gender is so pervasive. In a gender system, every noun has gender, and so speakers are constantly categorising. However, oceanic classifiers occur only in relation to possession, and so may not be as pervasive. And what happens in this context? We can see from the mixed evidence in other domains that the impact of thought on language is likely to be task specific. So it seems logical to explore oceanic classifiers using a range of different experimental tasks. This has never been attempted before and is exactly what we're doing here with this project. So I'll now pass you back over to Mike, who's going to tell you a little bit more about the oceanic classifiers and the systems that we are testing. OK, thank you, Ali. Um, so I'm just going to introduce the two main languages we're focusing on today, North Ambrim and EI, and also why we should be doing research on the languages spoken in the South Pacific. OK, so the language North Ambrim is spoken in the northern part of Ambrim Island in central Vanuatu. There are seven languages spoken on Ambrim, with North Ambrim being the largest language. There are both English and French medium schools in the community, 
And within the last within the last five or six years, the first three years of education are being delivered in the indigenous language. The language itself is fairly healthy. Uh, it's being passed on to children um, despite having so few speakers. But actually, by Vanuatu standards, um, North Ambrim is considered to have a large speaker population. Though out migration does pose a problem, and many have moved to the capital city, Port Villa, uh, where they marry partners from other language communities, which can result in the shift to the lingua franca Bislama. Uh, Vanuatu has also been named the most dangerous country in the world in terms of natural disasters. And apart from earthquakes and devastating cyclones, Ambrim has a highly active volcano whose past eruptions have resulted in the loss of one of the ind indigenous languages on the island. OK, and now I'm going to um, we'll now hear from Anne Lord Dot, who's a lecturer in, the, in linguistics at the University of New Caledonia, whose research focuses on the EI language, and she'll give a quick introduction to the EI language. For the last couple of years, I've been working on the expression of possession in Kanak languages, and more specifically in Yai, uh, which is the language of uh, Uvea. Uh, it is spoken by around 4,000 speakers and nowadays most of them are living in the urban area of Noumea. But in Uvea, Yai is the uh, language spoken at home or in the daily social interaction. And it also cohabits with uh, Faga Uvea or West uh, Uvean which come from the Polynesian branch of the Oceanic uh, languages. Uh, so most of the kids in Uvea are growing in a Yai speaking environment. But as there is no high school on the island and not many job opportunities, many of the people from Uvea uh, used to come to the city, to Numia on the main island, when people uh, move to the urban context, they are uh, more sensitive to drop their family language and to shift to uh, monolingual French uh, usage. Okay, thank you, Anne-Law. And we'll hear a little bit from Anne-Law uh, later as well. OK, so why do we want to do our research in the South Pacific when we could research languages closer to home? But one of the problems is that a lot of studies in psychology is that they come from what we call weird societies. So Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic societies. So what we understand about human cognition is really just based on a small sample of cultures. So well over 90 percent of psychological samples come from countries with about 12 percent of the world's population, such as North America, Europe as well as Australia and Israel. So most of what we know is based on a small set of cultures and a small set of languages. Uh, moreover, as each language may offer a unique insight into human cognition, we need to consider expanding our research into smaller endangered language communities. Um, and as you can see, there's a large chunk of the world's languages that are endangered. Um, but we also need to help ensure that these languages are continue to be spoken by the communities and one way we can do this is by promoting language maintenance activities such as vernacular language education. Uh, and one of the main ways uh, we can maintain the use of vernacular languages is, uh, is in vernacular education. And this is why we've teamed up with a graphic artist, Isabel Ritzenhalter, who's based in New Caledonia, and she's uh, been creating some beautiful illustrations, uh, some of those you've already seen before in the poll. Um, and we're going to be using these to make posters, dictionaries and other educational materials for the schools in the different langu language communities in Vanuatu and New Caledonia. Now, Anne Law is going to give a brief introduction to Isabel and her work because uh, unfortunately Isabel couldn't be here or provide a video for us. And we've been working also with an artist and uh, illustrator, book illustrator called Isabel Hitzentaylor. So she's been um, uh, working and illustrating many uh, children books uh, since more than 10 years here in New Caledonia and her work is quite well recognized uh, because she is very involved in um, the contextualization of her drawings, respecting the colors of New Caledonia, respecting 
the traditional cultures and the environment, the plants, the animals of New Caledonia. She illustrated a little book about uh, Kagu, which is uh, a kind of a very symbolic uh, bird here in New Caledonia because it is, it is endemic. And uh, this is a very funny story for young children with the story of Kagu. And it is written in French, but it comes from a DVD translated in Nengone, Jehu, Yai and Fagauvea, so the, the four islands of the Loyalty Islands. So it's a, a very nice one. And Isabel is uh, involved in many projects where um, literature and illustration and the object of books are uh, used in order to um, valorize and promote the, the cultures of New Caledonia. Okay, thank you, Anlo. Ooh, nearly just knocked my computer off there. Um, okay, so now we're going to learn a little bit more about the classifiers in um, North Ambrim and EI, and we're going to actually hear from the speakers of the languages themselves. Um, okay, so just give you a brief introduction to North Ambrim. There are five classifiers in North Ambrim, and remember these are only used in possessive constructions when you talk about the objects that you own. Um, so, for instance, we have uh, a food classifier for things that you can eat. Uh, we have a drink classifier for things that you can drink, such as water. One that's associated with uh, items for fire, such as firewood. Um, there's one for baskets and there's one uh, for everything else, uh, anything that doesn't fit into the other classifiers. Now, there's a general tendency in North Ambrim for the object to be a little bit more stuck in their, in their classifier categories but there is some uh, freedom for an object to move to a different classifier category. Uh, and of course, there's some actual added semantic complex complexity to the system, which we'll see in a little bit. But now uh, I'd like you to go back to uh, the Poly Everywhere tab that hopefully you haven't closed down, or if not, go back to www.polyev.com forward slash optimal. Um, and you'll see those uh, 10 objects again, um, along with the five classifiers in North Ambrim. And I'd ask you to have a go yourselves and see which of the objects, which objects do you think go with the different classifiers. So it should be live now. Uh, OK, it's definitely activated now. So yeah, have a look at those uh, objects again, the same objects as before. And let me know which ones you think go with the food classifier, which ones with the drink, which one go with the basket, the fire and the general classifier. Some of them might be a little bit obvious, others might actually be a little bit more complicated than you originally first think. Okay, basket with the basket classifier, exactly. That's a good answer. Uh, pigs go with food, so both the pigs go with food. Uh, food, the coconut and the pig. Uh, pig, the coconut, the cooked pig and the green coconut with the food. Uh, yeah, and the sprouting coconut also with the food as well. OK. Drink equals the young coconut. Yeah, the green coconut. That's interesting. Um, what about the house and the canoe? Where do you think and the machete? Where do you think they go? A machete in general. OK, that makes sense. The hut, knife and canoe are in general, OK, because they don't fit into the other ones so easily. The fire and the cooked pig, uh, drink, basket, general. OK, the fire and the cooked pig also go into general. OK, and the house goes into general, OK. Yeah. Ooh, oh gosh, the answers are coming quickly now. Hard to read them so quickly. Uh, maybe one type of coconut goes in the drink one. OK, so I'm just going to say thank you now for all of your comments. Um, if you're a North Ambrim speaker, some of those would be right, but some of them might not be right. Um, oh, someone's just put knife to go with the food classifier, perhaps because it's used for collecting food. That's quite an interesting one. And what we we'll do now is uh, if you come back to the main talk now, we're going to go on uh, and actually hear from a speaker of North Ambrim themselves 
uh, who's going to categorize those objects for you. OK, so if you come back now to the main talk, please, and I'll move on. OK, so now we're going to hear from Willie Tekon, who's going to describe how he can categorize these objects in his classifier system. He speaks North Ambrim. Afterwards, I'll give you a visual recap as well, though. Nisame Willie Tekon, Namru Ambrim Island, Topole Orfanwadu, Mening Oman, Namro Rutuan Kon, Gamururan English of Islama, Romelan Tolonkin. Nam Yakia Ral Pe Pevir, Nam Yaka Tolong, Nam Yaka Pislama, Nam Yaka English, Pulbul, Nam Takuli Yahu, Gamalam, Tamam Huri Pe Pulubul, Tamamre. Lien an ga tem ni mon te mam re li ka kai be sul ale mam nga fo pul si ne li an nier te pul pul mam re fe meneng bul bul ayi lo ga mam nga ka je nga lon im ne fo fo an te pam ga mam ro ta li ye ne mam ro bu bul or ne ro ro ne ka ma lon se se ma lang ayi Ketian karo lo ni kama mamro jen, aji mamro fe yeng aji, pone ka na fe na kali e e aji na fe amaji, sena amaji me na kali pulu 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 yan, tetelong lengre, tetelong lengre, im mam tali yeng malam, te mam tatukur. On Marlon Marlon Nil, et Mamro Mamro lui a imgané à Wanyer. Im Mamro fait Mangim Manim. Te var, te n'ga Mamro ne var nan, te Mamro no. Var Mamro fait yeng var, an var. Ol mur Mamro petien mur an ngaru. Ol mumur mamre fe mengol ena fe mengol mumur nangne yengol mumur ol golo pete naga mamro kiki te mamro ne te mamro ne roy roy oil ol golo mamre fe yengol golo namnu ol golo ona fe namnu Mengolok lo, terlalu nafas anol lo, hari ni le, tekan nang ni, pada kata yang berangan lo terlalu nafas majen, pung sang, man sang, arpol rawo. Number one, Arpol ne liye hu raki hu ya li li te muru san ne liwo tong Arpol meneng Arpol tong Arpol teh miye ya miye par par minur roy ten minum luman teh par par garafang. Mamrong ni, mamro fe yeng par par, ame ka na fe na sene yeng par par, paneneng ewi amre ngam tonga mamro fe yeng par par. Okay, thank you, Willie. I'm just going to give you a little visual recap now of what Willie said to summarize it. So here are all the items that he said could occur with the food classifier. Note that it includes items which aren't currently food, such as the pig, which is alive, but also the machete. Uh, and Willie did give a reason for that. He says because it's to use to gather food with as well. Um, but it, the machete can only ever occur with the food classifier, nothing else. Now, fire goes with the fire classifier and basket with the basket classifier. This is where things get a little bit more complicated. So a canoe can only occur with the general classifier, um, but so can the basket. But no, there's no real semantic difference between uh, the meaning when either classifier is used uh, with the basket or the general classifier there. 
Uh, and the drink classifier has a rather complex semantics, um, which always includes the word for house, uh, but also sometimes for fires as well. Obviously, houses aren't drinkable objects. Uh, there was a historical quirk whereby the word for house in part resembled the drink classifier, making house be reanalyzed as a member of that classifier category. Now, both fire and basket classifiers seem to be falling out of use a little bit, and the entities uh, which occur in those uh, classifiers are being reclassified into other categories. So that's why we're getting basket occurring with a general classifier and fire with a drink with perhaps other sort of domestic uh, objects there. OK, now EI, on the other hand, spoken in New Caledonia, has a much larger classifier inventory of 24 classifiers. I'm not going to list them all here, but it has the same classifiers as North Ambrim that we've seen before, but also some unique classifiers that aren't found in many other oceanic languages. Uh, for instance, there's a, a one a classifier for domesticated animals. There's one for the things that you plant or things growing on your land. There's one specifically for sugarcane and other sort of things that you can chew. Uh, and there's one, uh, a classifier for catch or for things that you hunt. So here for fish that you've caught. Um, I'm not going to get you to classify the objects again according to the EI classifier system, but we'll just hear from two EI speakers, Erlin and Mala, about how they'd uh, classify the different objects we showed you. Bossu, je m'appelle Shaori Erlin. Je suis étudiant en première année en licence en langue culture océanienne. Je suis originaire de l'île d'Ouvéa et euh, je suis plurilingue. Je, euh, je parle IAI, le Faga Ouvéa et le français. Bosso, je m'appelle Madame Mendia, je suis originaire d'Ouvéa, plus précisément de la tribu de Banouch, au centre de l'île. Je suis étudiante en langue et culture océanienne à l'université de la Nouvelle-Calédonie. Je suis plurilingue, je parle le IAI. Le Fada et le Français. Alors, on dit euh, caropé. On ne retrouve plus ce genre de transport pour la possession. Ben, ici, pour la pirogue, on va plutôt utiliser le classificateur euh, Taboc euh, Caropé. Taboc. En Yaï, on dit euh, Uma Ito. La case, elle représente euh, l'organisation sociale. Aussi à Ouvéa, euh, la majorité des maisons en fait ont une case. C'est une maison traditionnelle, on va dire. Que c'est ma case, on va dire euh, Umuk Ito. Moi personnellement, je dirais Anik Ito. Ça, par Ouvéa, ben, on dit euh, Elegan. Tout le monde l'utilise pour le chant, pour aller au chant. Pour... En fait, c'est un objet qui fait partie du quotidien. Mon sabre, ben, on, on, on utilise le classificateur euh, Anik. On a ici le Wanko, c'est-à-dire hein, le fruit en fait de la noix. Et euh, là, pour dire que c'est à moi, je dirais plutôt un euh, Ok Wanko. Mm -hmm. et, euh, et le classificateur ici, c'est le Nook pour euh, les pieds d'arbres à planter. Alors à la langue, ça se dit Wanou ou Wanou It. Je pense que ce sont, ce sont les aînés qui boivent beaucoup euh, le, le coco vert. Et euh, les jeunes, euh, ils boivent rarement en fait. J'utiliserai plutôt le classificateur bélique pour dire boire. Oui, c'est le seul. D'accord. À la langue, on dit aussi euh, Wanou. C'est quelque chose qui est beaucoup, plus, qui est beaucoup utilisé sur, dans le quotidien car on fait la cuisine avec. On... La, note, la note coco, c'est un gagne-pain pour euh, les gens qui ne travaillent pas sur OVA. Alors pour la possession, on dit Okwanu. Euh, Alors ici, pour, euh, le coco, pour la note coco, on ne peut pas dire un Beliguanu parce que ben, ce n'est pas, pas un liquide. Alors à Ouvéa, on utilise le feu pour soit réchauffer la maison. On utilise beaucoup le feu pour faire la cuisine ou sinon pour nettoyer, que ce soit au champ ou à la maison. On va utiliser le classificateur général qui est ANIC. Parce qu'en fait, il n'y a pas de classificateur spécifique pour le feu. En Yaï, on dit BOKA. Et à Ouvéa, on peut... 
a ouvert toutes les maisons en un parc à cochons. Et voilà, en fait, c'est un animal domestique. Et pour, un, pour dire que c'est mon cochon, je dis un Halek, Halek Boka. On voit un cochon grillé. Et ici, on va plutôt utiliser le classificateur Hawk. Comme euh, voilà, on le cuit pour manger. Ok, thank you, Ellen and Marla, for that. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick um, recap of what they've said. Just resizing my windows. Ok, there we go. OK, so here's a summary of how Helen and Malak categorize these entities. So green coconuts, the only object here to occur with a drink classifier. So that's very different to North Ambrum. The houses don't occur with a drink classifier here, but they have their own special classifier. Now, there is a classifier for domestic animals, as we saw before. So the live pig uh, goes with domestic animals and not the food classifier, as in North Ambrum. There is a classifier for the things that you plant or are growing on your land. Um, there's things that uh, there's a classifier for things that you sit on, such as chairs, but it's also been extended to different modes of transport, like canoes and cars. Um, we actually forgot to ask Elin and Mala about baskets, but there is a special basket classifier as well. Um, here are the items for the food classifier, so much more limited uh, than in North Ambrim. Uh, but finally, there is a larger scope for the general classifier. So machete uh, and fire aren't classified by special classifiers um, though actually there is a um, there is a special fire classifier in the language but not many people use it anymore just like the house classifier where she said where I think Ellen said that it's just the elders who are using the house classifier so a lot of people have reclassified these items with a general classifier Ooh. Ooh. yeah sorry about that okay now I'm going to pass over to um, Ali again, who's going to explain how our research enables us to understand this huge amount of variation in the size of the classifier systems and how they're used by speakers uh, themselves and if they impact cognition. OK, thank you very much, Mike. So our first experiment is a list task where participants are prompted with each of the classifiers in their language in a randomised order and they're asked to list all of the nouns that go with that classifier. And this shows us how consistent speakers are in terms of relating nouns to classifiers. And it also shows us which nouns are the most salient or prototypical for each classifier as people tend to list these items first. We also used a video vignette task where participants watch videos of people interacting differently with various items. And in the examples here, you can see someone drinking water and then washing with the water. And we also use videos that involve typical and atypical interactions such as writing on paper and eating paper. Participants had to narrate what was happening in the videos and this revealed how they used the classifiers in conjunction with the items and whether this changed as the interactions with those items changed. So the third experiment that I'll focus on is a card sorting experiment. And here participants were asked to sort 60 pictures of items intended to represent classifiers across all our languages. They did a free sort where they could categorize the pictures in any way they saw fit, just as you did in the first poll today. And they then did a structured sort where they were instructed to categorize the pictures based on how the classifiers in their language do that. And the alignment between the sorting in each task shows us if and how the classifiers are structuring how participants categorise these items. So the languages we have chosen have been really carefully selected for several reasons. First, they have varying numbers of possessive classifiers ranging from 2 to 24. And they also vary in the transparency of classifier membership and how semantic this categorisation is. And they represent various stages of grammaticalization from noun to classifier to gender. So I'll talk you through some of the results now. Um, in the list task where speakers had to list all of the nouns associated with each classifier in their language, languages with larger classifier inventories list more nouns in total. And interestingly, in these languages, relatively fewer nouns are unique to only one classifier compared to languages with smaller classifier inventories. And this suggests that more classifier-like systems assign nouns to classifiers in a less rigid way, indicating that categorization of these concepts is more cognitively flexible. 
In the video vignette task, where speakers were asked to describe interactions with objects that were happening in the videos, languages with smaller classifier inventories show less overlap, most often using just one classifier in relation to an object. And this demonstrates more consistent use of classifiers compared to languages with larger classifier inventories. And these findings indicate that more gender-like systems classify nouns in a more consistent way, suggesting that speakers' cognition of these concepts is more rigid. Now to the card sorting task. So here, the different coloured bars represent the different tasks. In red, the free sort, where participants were asked to sort the images in any way they saw fit. And in blue, the structured sort, where they were asked to sort the images according to the classifiers in their language. And the results from both these two types of tasks are shown for each language and the height of the bars indicates the average number of piles that were made. Now, in an idealised system where categories are cognitively salient, we would expect the mean number of piles to be the same in each task and to match the classifier inventory exactly. However, what we see here is that we actually get different numbers of piles produced within the structured sort than there are classifiers in the language. And the numbers of piles are most similar across the two tasks for EI and for Nalemwa with the biggest numbers of classifiers. And this suggests that classifier categories may be more cognitively salient for these more extreme systems. So we see from our results that when classifiers are overt and explicit within a task, they appear to have greater influence on how a speaker uses them. And this is shown by the different task demands across our experiments. So from our work, we see that language seems to be facilitating thought, but not constraining it. And we can think about this as a theory of categorization in context, where classifiers influence thought differently, depending on the context and how they are being used. And our next set of experiments will help us to find out more about this and to answer further questions about the relationship between language and thought. So we do have more to find out and more questions to answer. Um, and we'll also leave you with some important questions to ponder. So if language does affect how we think, does that mean that every child should learn at least one foreign language? Does learning a new language facilitate flexibility of thought or open up different ways of thinking? Can important texts be just translated? Are there constraints in translation whereby thoughts expressible in one language can't be fully captured in another. Our project is helping to document the endangered languages and we are testing that we are testing, but does it matter if the languages of North Ambrim and EI survive until the 22nd century? Does preservation of language also preserve culture? What do you think? So thanks go to all of the team involved in this event, uh, to our participants, the speakers of these fascinating languages, and to the Economic and Social Research Council for funding our project. Very special thanks go to Isabel Ritzenhalter, whose beautiful illustrations bring our nouns and classifiers to life. And thank you very much for listening. So as Mike said at the start, if you would like a postcard with one of these beautiful images, please do send an email to smg at surrey.ac.uk, um, which you can also see here on the slide and in the Q&A equally. Um, and in the Q&A, we've had some great questions coming through during the session. So thank you very much for that. Um, and we've got a few minutes now to, to come to those. So we will come to as many of those questions as we possibly can. I'll pass back over to Mike to, to manage that Q&A. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let's start with some of these questions. Um, okay. Okay, let's start. Uh, I've got one here. Um, so really interesting to see that some of the classifiers can change uh, with use and some can't. It seems, uh, is there any rule about that? Um, Grev, would you like to answer that question? That was um, a really interesting question. And I think there are two um, things in conflict going on. One is that um, where a classifier is being lost, and that will be typically one of those with fewer members, then uh, the nouns which could be classified that way will be classified differently by different speakers 
according to the extent to which they're retaining this classifier. And on the other hand, for the core, core items are less likely to be moved than fringe. So something like water will tend to be classified as drinkable um, because it's one of the core items. And we've seen that as in the uh, video you saw, saw that speakers will treat water as uh, drinkable even when it's being used for other things. OK, thank you, Gavin. I'd just like to add to that as well, actually. I mean, there's also interesting changes that are happening um, in terms of language change itself and language uh, shift, um, especially within the last you know, 100 years or so. There's been a huge, massive uh, cultural shift in Vanuatu and New Caledonia. And a lot of the sort of traditional culture and traditional ways of living uh, aren't being done anymore. Um, so you can sort of see that from what Erlin and Mala said, uh, the I speakers, when they're talking about uh, the elders do these sorts of things and we don't do it anymore. So, for instance, you know, they, there was a house classifier um, which the elders still use, but the younger generation don't use anymore. So these items are being reclassified. Uh, similar to the, um, I think they said that the, uh, which one was it now? I can't remember now the other one. Um, uh, the fire classifier isn't being used anymore. They have their own, they reclassify items in the general classifier. And the same things are going in um, in North Ambrim as well. So the smaller classifiers, so that classifiers with a limited amount of membership aren't being used as much anymore. And these items are being reclassified. So thank you for that question. Um, but a question here, um, you mentioned that you have more experiments to come. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about those experiments? I think Ali is best place to answer those questions. I'll pass you on to Ali. Sure, thank you, Mike. Yeah, that's a, a really good question. Um, and we've got some really exciting things coming up, actually. So it's nice to be able to uh, to talk about those. So um, we've got the, the small um, element of a global pandemic to navigate before we can get back out to Vanuatu and New Caledonia. Um, but when we do, we've got three experiments that we'd like to conduct in the field out there. Um, the first of those is an eye tracking experiment. So this is where participants are shown pairs of items from the card sorting task um, following an auditory classifier queue. Um, one of the items in the pair is congruent with the classifier and one is on incongruent. And we're looking to see which item participants look at first and what their pattern of looking is across the different pairs. And this is a really excellent technique because it shows us how the auditory classifier is automatically processed. So we get this insight into this very fast, very speedy processing. Um, and we expect that participant looking time will be different for, for congruent and, and incongruent items. So we'll be looking to see how that pattern pans out. Um, we've also got a possessive labelling task. So this is where participants are presented with nouns produced in the list task and they have to say which classifier they would use in conjunction with each of the nouns. And this will really help to cross reference the list task data and provide more information on consistency of classifier usage across speakers. Um, the last experiment that we're planning to do out in the field is um, a storyboard uh, experiment and this is where participants see a series of cartoons and they have to describe what's happening. So we use this task to test something called anaphora, um, which is referring back to previously mentioned entities. Um, and this is tracking the use of the classifiers um, to see again how consistent it is. And we'll also be using the images in our storyboards to make books for um, the, the indigenous school children, which will help them to learn the classifiers and obviously help with the preservation of these languages. Um, and the final experiment, just to give you a brief overview of, um, is one that we're planning to conduct here in the UK. Um, this is a category training experiment where we will train groups of English speaking participants, participants on classifiers from a subset of our languages. Um, and this will give us an insight into how these systems are learnt and whether different systems make it harder or easier to identify and recall items in relation to classifiers. So does having 24 classifiers, for example, make it harder to learn a system or does the relative semantic transparency of a system like this, in fact, make it easier to learn? So, as I said, lots of exciting things coming up um, and lots more to, to find out on this project and lots more, more data to come. Thank you, Ali. Um, got a couple more questions coming. Um, Adam wants to know if this presentation will be made available afterwards and if the research has been published anywhere. Uh, yeah, we're planning on actually um, 
having this talk being published on YouTube, but a, a more extended version with longer videos from the speakers themselves and more explanation. Um, we'll have that up in a, a couple of months, I think. Um, we can email everybody who's on the Eventbrite list as well um, to say that that's up. Uh, and is it being published anywhere? Yes, uh, we're, we are writing up other results as we speak and uh, we should have a publication out soon in, I think it's called Kedernos, which is the Brazilian Linguistics Association, um, as we did a talk with them recently. Uh, and then we'll be publishing in various other outlets as well. But if you want, you can um, send us an email and we can keep you in the loop when we do publish anything as well. Um, there's another question uh, here. When speakers of North Ambrim or EI speak other language, other languages, have you ever observed them compensating classifier meanings periphrastically in a way that monolingual speakers of English or French, etc., might not? Uh, so if they would sort of say things like, uh, uh, I drink my drinkable coconut, um, if they were to speak English. No, I haven't seen them do that. That's never done. When they speak uh, in, in Vanuatu, when they speak Bislama or English, they'll just speak Bislama or English. And uh, Bislama does, is a bit like English. It doesn't have any classifiers. It just has one way of saying, this is mine, which is blong. So coconut, blong me, my coconut. Um, and in uh, New Caledonia, I haven't spent that much time there. So I haven't seen if they do do that or not, but I, I presume not. Um, let's see if we've got any other questions. Uh, OK, thank you for the talk. Uh, that's really interesting. I'm wondering how children acquire the knowledge of classifiers. Will they make mistakes in using classifiers during the learning process? And is this knowledge innate? Um, I guess I'll uh, have a go at this as well then. Um, when children are learning classifiers, I mean, I haven't done, haven't done looked specifically at how children are acquiring the classifier systems. And actually, we have that as an idea for a follow up project is to actually focus specifically on children. Um, but what I have noticed, you know, I've spent quite a bit of time in North Ambrim, um, is that uh, they do make mistakes, of course, as, as all children do. Um, people will say, oh, you know, the older generation will always point out the children's mistakes and say, oh, you know, that's, you know, I could say that if uh, if I was a child or, you know, when I'm asking for grammaticality judgments. Um, so they do make mistakes. Uh, and I don't think it's innate. They're definitely learnt. Um, but I don't know, maybe I'll pass on to Ali if she has any thoughts about that. Yeah, I can I can add to that, Mike. Thank you. Um, yeah, and that's a, another really, really interesting question. Um, and I, I mentioned when I was talking about the relationship between language and thought um, about the evidence in infancy for um, categorical representations. So um, it's really difficult to make claims about innateness. Um, and that's a, a part of the question, really. But we certainly see that infants who are really, really young have these sort of set categories in place. Um, this hasn't yet been done looking at classifiers, and that's something that we would be really interested to look at. But much of the work that I've done so far has looked at colour as a domain, so looking at categorisation of colour as a testing ground to explore this relationship between language and thought. And we actually see really fascinating things in infants that they have um, categories in place from a very, very young age, so from as early as three months of age. Um, and they actually have these categorical representations where their brains respond differently to these categories when we do electrophysiological tests on them. Um, and in adults, really interestingly, we get lots of differences um, in colour categories because languages across the world segment colour space really differently. Um, so we see that reflected um, in differences in perception for speakers of different languages. Um, and that's really fascinating. That's really showing us evidence for language. And we've pinned that down. So when children actually start to acquire terms in this example, colour, that's when they get this shift. So it almost looks like there's sort of possibly innate perceptual categories that we have. Um, and then language kind of comes into play and shapes that and, and moulds that as we learn words for things. So as we learn colour terms or as we learn classifiers, possibly that will happen too. Um, and then we see more influence of, of language in adulthood. So really great question, really interesting one and one that we've got lots more work to, to do on as well, particularly in this in this domain of, of classifiers and grammatical gender. OK, thank you, Ali. Uh, we've got one. I think we've got time for one last question. Um, here's one. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how different classifier systems link with different belief systems? I'll pass over to Grev if you have any thoughts on that. Thank you. 
Um, good question. Uh, there are different sorts of classifiers. We've talked today about possessive ones, uh, more widespread unnumeral classifiers. So in some languages, when you use a numeral, you would have a classifier two. So um, six round object orange as opposed to six flat object plate. And in these sorts of systems, uh, for example, in Lao, uh, we do find classifiers for, let's say, monks or for God and so on. Um, so in the, there are instances, though um, not very common. OK, thank you, Greb. Um, I think that's all the time we have uh, available for questions. We don't want to run over our time uh, past 11 o'clock. Uh, so I just want to thank everybody for coming and attending and for your really interesting questions. As I said before, we'll be um, hopefully publishing this on YouTube uh, in, a, in a month or so time with a sort of more extended uh, in-depth look at how these classifier systems function. So thank you everyone for, for joining us and uh, and please send us an email if you would like uh, any of the, if you like an image uh, that Isabel has done. So just send us your postal address and we can send you out a postcard as well. Thank you very much and goodbye from all of us.